Father in heaven, I thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this evening that we can share gathered around your word and hearing from you and learning from you, Father. Lord, I know there are some here who are joining us for the first time in the Revelation study. I pray for illumination that they'll pick up real quickly where we are. Father, for those of us who have been going through this week to week, that we would continue to build on the foundation that you've been laying. And Lord, we understand and we know that there is no other foundation that can be laid except Jesus Christ. And so tonight, as we study the book of Revelation, we study it to see Jesus, to know him better, to draw near to him. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow us to do this very thing, to see Jesus in fresh and new ways, to be invigorated, to be quickened, Father, to find ourselves more alive because of Jesus in us. Father, make the book live to us, and may we live to the book in Jesus' name. Amen. Tom, you can bring it down just a little bit. This is kind of a booming, almost too preachish. The book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. Revelation is the word apocalypsis. In the Greek, it means an unveiling, which means the idea behind this book, the purpose, is not to frighten, but to enlighten. The idea behind the revelation is not to bring confusion or consternation, but illumination and explanation and exhilaration. As you have seen, if you've been studying through, it's amazing that you can read a, a chapter, a passage, a section of scripture and be exhilarated by it. And yet that's what happens almost every time we open up God's word. Well, I'll say every time there is an exhilarating sense of the Holy Spirit speaking and teaching and moving. And, and we will experience that, I believe, again tonight. Now, again, if you're joining us for the first time, there's some things you've missed, some things you might not know. So by way of catching you up and helping the rest of us really lock into what we've been studying, Jesus, after, well, turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. The great thing about Revelation is that it's very easy to understand. It's not a difficult book. That's the lie that's out there, and I'm sure you've heard that, that, oh, it's, it's a hard book. It's a challenging book. It's one that you really want to put off until you've studied the Bible for a while. And I've said this before. I'll, I'll say it again, that Revelation is probably the first book I would want to teach somebody who's just become a Christian. Because it is so powerful, it's so awesome, it is so clearly a picture of who Jesus is right now, today. Revelation 119, and I'll share this with you all. Again, if you're joining us for the first time, you'll want to know this. It is the outline, the divine outline for the entire book of Revelation. Revelation 19, 119, Jesus says to John, who wrote down the Revelation, he says, Therefore, write the things which you have seen. The things which you have seen. That is the person of Jesus Christ. At the moment that Jesus said this to John, he had seen Jesus glorified. Jesus in his ultimate glorified state. You get a description of that in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. An amazing description. Write that which you have seen. And then secondly, Jesus says, and write the things which are. The things which are. Present tense. What are the things which are? The church age. The people of Jesus Christ. The things which are. That carries us through chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation which talks to the seven churches, seven letters to seven churches. We'll look at it in a moment. And in those seven letters, Jesus not only, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll just say it's the people of Jesus Christ, second part of the outline. And then part three, Jesus says, and write the things which will take place after these things. And that begins at the beginning of chapter four. Well, how do we know that? Because that phrase, after these things, is repeated twice in verse 1 of chapter 4. It's the first time the verse is repeated again. The, the phrase, it's metatauta in the Greek, after these things. So you've got a three-part divine outline for the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, the person of Jesus Christ. Chapters 2 and 3, the people of Jesus Christ. And chapter 4, through the end of the book, the prophetic plan of Jesus Christ. The plan that shows, it, and that, it, it's all that is coming, it's all that is yet future, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4. And I look forward to chapter 4, we're going to get there, not next week, but the week after, and it is absolutely mind-boggling, because in chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation, we are in heaven. So in two weeks, whether or not we're raptured, we're going to see heaven. So you can look forward to that. It's good stuff. Now, Jesus, in chapters 2 and 3, again, gives John seven personal letters. He says, I want you to write these seven letters to these seven different churches. And here's how they apply. There's a fourfold application of these seven letters. 
Seven churches, you who have been studying, you remember, it's to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira. It's to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These were seven actual churches. So the first application is simply historically these letters apply. Seven real churches that existed in John's day in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. Historical application. Secondly, is a corporate application. These letters apply corporately to the whole church. In other words, any church of any time can read any one of these letters and learn and apply Jesus' message to this church. And we've talked about that, and I hope that we do that as we're studying through this. We're applying what we're hearing Jesus tell Sardis, for example, and we apply that to the bridge or to wherever you attend. That you look at your, your church, the corporate body of Christ, and you can apply these letters that way. You also can apply these personally. Jesus says with each letter, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let the individual hear. Apply this to your life. Sardis, last week we talked about, it, was the dead church. What do you do with a dead church? We're going to talk more about that tonight. What do you do with a dead church? Well, what do you do with a dead Christian? You can apply the same thing to your own life. We'll see this. But most amazing of all, and most exciting for me of all, is that these seven churches apply prophetically. That means they are prophecies. For John they were. Not for us as much. For us they're more history than they are prophecy. Well, what do you mean by that, Rick? When John received these letters to these seven churches, he wrote them, he sent them to the seven churches. Little could he have known at the time that these applied to seven eras of church history that we can track and mark across the last 2,000 years. And if you've been studying this, you know it. It's amazing. Even the names of the towns in which the churches are located speak of times in church history. And it's so specific that it's, it's, there's no way you can deny it once you've read it and studied it. If you haven't read this, by the way, CDs will be available for this study. We, we actually, as of right now, I have to get it to a net and get them burned. But you can get individual uh, audio copy CDs that you can stick in your car stereo or home stereo or whatever, which is kind of cool. It's the first time we've had that. But that will be available for each one of the seven churches. And we'll just kind of keep making those available as we go. But that'll be really soon. So if you've missed one or you can't be here on a particular Sunday night, you can, you can get caught up. And I encourage you to do that. This is a book that builds on itself. So from chapter to chapter to chapter, the more you have studied, the more you followed it through, the more the next chapter is going to make sense to you. Okay? Now... With each of these letters, Jesus follows a basic pattern. These are things we've already covered. I'm just doing this real quickly so you can catch up. Each church in these letters will receive several things. Jesus says in each letter, he gives a partial revelation of himself. A partial revelation. We'll see it again tonight with the Church of Philadelphia. A partial revelation of his own glorious nature. The whole thing is described in chapter 1, but then in the letters he'll take one or two lines of his self-description. And he'll apply it to that particular church. And it does apply to that church. He comes to that particular church with a certain designation of who he is. And it makes sense to that church and what they're dealing with or what they're struggling with. He gives a partial revelation. Then he begins with a positive affirmation. Which is always a great way to get someone to open up their ears. Start positively. Parents, it's a great way to talk to your kids. Start with the positive and, and then if you've got to deal with the negative, well then deal with it. But start positive. It may, we all want to hear the good stuff. The negative stuff I don't want to, want to really hear, but I will hear it. I'll, I'm open to it if you started with the positive. Well, Jesus does that, positive affirmation. But then he goes to a punitive admonition, or if you want to say a corrective accusation. He lays down the line. Here's what you're good at. Here's what's going well. Here's what's wrong and must be changed. And he doesn't pull any punches with this. He's very straightforward. Finally, with each letter, he ends with a practical recommendation. Here's what this particular church can do. And then he gives an eternal motivation for each church to say, Oh, so there's something to look forward to, something to come, a reason for following through with what Jesus asked me to do or asked us to do with this letter. Now, a couple of important exceptions to this pattern for each letter. I'm sorry for moving fast, but there's so much other stuff I want to get to. I just got to lay this down. A couple of exceptions to this pattern of writing that Jesus does. The first exception is that there are two churches of the seven that will receive no positive affirmation whatsoever. Jesus had nothing good to say about the church in Sardis. Not a single positive word. And the second church, which we will deal with next week, Laodicea. Jesus has nothing good to say about Laodicea. 
But on the other side of things, there are two churches among these seven that receive no corrective accusation, no punitive admonition. Jesus doesn't get on to them. There is nothing wrong with two of these churches as far as Jesus is concerned. He had nothing bad to say about Smyrna. Smyrna was the second church that received the letter. We studied and read about Smyrna. Smyrna representing that time in church history of the persecuted church. You may recall Smyrna means myrrh. And for myrrh to get its sweet fragrance, that spice myrrh, it has to be crushed. And Smyrna was the crushed church. It was the church of persecution. About A.D., right from the beginning of the church all the way up to about Q, let's see, 312 A.D. is the time frame on that. And again, if you haven't heard this and you're curious about this, this is just kind of raising questions for you, we'll have the CDs available. You'll want to pick them up and check this out. But the second church that Jesus has nothing negative to say about is Philadelphia. Philadelphia that we'll look at tonight. By the way, historically, there are only two cities of all these seven cities that have lasted all the way till present day. Smyrna and Philadelphia. The two churches Jesus had nothing bad to say, anything bad to say about. Those two cities yet remain today. All the rest of the cities changed, were wiped out, were built over, whatever. Those two cities remain. Now, something else of interest, four of these churches, four of these seven churches, still exist in character today. Now, you've got to get your arms around this, and if you're new to this thinking, just do your best to track with me here. Each of these seven churches speak of seven epochs or eras in church history. Seven different time periods that you can attach to each particular church. With the first three churches, there was a definite in, uh, beginning point and end point. For the first three, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, all three had a starting point and an ending point in history as, as an age of the church. The last four, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, the last four, all had a starting point but still exist in some form or another today. Still exist today. Let me, let me help you see this maybe a little better. You can look at it as four church-isms. Four isms for the church today. Thyatira. Thyatira would represent or prophesy or, or indicate Roman Catholicism. Four isms. Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism can be defined as living for the church. Living for the church. Those of you who have a Roman Catholic background or know anything about the Catholic Church know that the church is of utmost importance. Living for the church. You have to be a part of the church. You've got to take the sacraments in the church. The church saves. It is all about the church. And so living for the church, Thyatira, Roman Catholicism, the second ism would be Sardis. Sardis, the church at Sardis is denominationalism, and we talked about that last week. Whereas Roman Catholicism would be living for the church, denominationalism would be living for the past. Living for the past. Clinging to a name. Jesus said to Sardis, I know you have a name. You think you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. And you may recall from last week, that word name is onoma in the Greek. Onoma, which is where we get our word denomina denomination. Denomination coming from onoma. You have a name. The problem with denominationalism is clinging to a name that was created at some point in the past. It's living to the past. The third ism. The third ism, which we'll look at next week, but I'll go ahead and give you right now, would be Laodicea, and that is libertarianism. Libertarianism, which is living for the self. Laodicea, by the way, is the worst of the seven churches, and is represented pretty strongly in churches today. Living for the self. So Roman Catholicism, denominationalism, libertarianism, and finally what we'll look at tonight, my favorite one, I think Jesus' favorite church of the seven, evangelism, evangelism, which is living for the lost. Man, once you've been saved, your life on earth is not about your life on earth. Once you've been saved by Jesus Christ, blood bought by Jesus, you exist on this planet for one primary purpose, and that's to live for the lost, to love lost people into the kingdom. To love God primarily and then to love your neighbor as yourself for the sake of their salvation. And that's where I want to be. I don't want to be in Thyatira where the church holds sway over me. I don't want to live in Sardis where the movement has become a mausoleum. Certainly not Laodicea, which leaves a bad taste in the mouth. We'll see that clearly. But I want to live 
in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm not talking about the city on the East Coast, which is interesting. A lot of the cities on the East Coast draw their names from biblical cities. We're, we're come, you know, the idea was, was came straight out of Scripture, which so somewhat where our country began and where our country uh, came from. But I want to live in Philadelphia. Philadelphia prophetically. Philadelphia, the church that wakes up, that woke up to the outward call of the Lord. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 2, to the church at Sardis, he said, wake up. Wake up, Sardis. Well, how do you do that? How do you wake up a dead church? How do you wake up a dead person? How do you take a faith that has died and is dried and is cracked and seems lifeless and useless and quicken it back to life? How do you go about this? Jesus will show us how tonight with Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia we'll discover God's method of breathing life back into a church, back into a person. You can truly apply this to yourself. Well, let's go back a bit. Thinking prophetically. At the place in history, the church at Philadelphia prophetically would speak of that time in church history which started about 1783 and continues today. And will go all the way up to the point of the rapture of the church. 1783 to the rapture of the church. I'll share that again if you missed that. But what was it about 1783? What, what is it about that year? A young cobbler, a young cobbler and part-time preacher was living just outside of London. On the bookshelf in his cobbler's shop, he had two books. He had the Bible, well-worn and, and often read. And he also had a journal. The Journal of Captain Cook, a, a, a South Seas Pacific Island adventurer. A man, by the way, who discovered the Sandwich Islands, which makes sense if you think about it. Captain Cook, Sandwich Islands, <laughs> kind of works together. But Captain Cook discovered the Sandwich Islands, which you may know what those are, the Hawaiian Islands. But this young cobbler would read Captain Cook and he'd read his Bible. And he'd read Captain Cook and he'd read his Bible. He loved the adventure. He loved the thought of getting out and doing something. And he loved the Word of God. Well, after a while, this cobbler preacher began to find out that working on souls, S-O-L-E-S, was not as great, as wonderful, as important as working on souls, S-O-U-L-S, the souls of people. His passion began to burn, and on May 31st, 19, I'm sorry, I said 1783, 1793, so I want to go back and scratch that out. May 31st, 1793, this cobbler preacher, who was paid 10 pounds a year, <laughs> So I wasn't going to share that because if any of the elders hear that and, you know, salary time comes up. They paid him 10 pounds a year. He supplemented his income by teaching in a local school and by cobbling shoes. But this cobbler went into his church on a Sunday morning, May 31st, 1793. And midway into the service, he stood up to share the word of God. The word that had been burning in him. A passion that had been alive in him. And what he shared was a vision that he believed the Lord had given him planted firmly in his heart. He read from Isaiah chapter 54 verse 2, which says, and I quote, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. And he began to share how he believed that God wanted him personally, not the church, not somebody else, but him to go into foreign missions. To leave that cozy little town in England and literally head across the seas. To go and reach people who hadn't heard of the great gospel of Jesus Christ. He took literally the words of Jesus, going to all the world making disciples. And he said, I want to go. Send me to India. Send me to India. That little church did. And unwittingly... This young man began an entire new era in church history, set off a new spark, a new flame that eventually would be known as, as we look back, the modern missionary movement. His name was William Carey. William Carey. He was an unschooled man. He had possibly an elementary school training about that far. He could read, he could write, he studied the Bible voraciously. Of course, he read Captain Cook's journal. But he didn't have a college education. He hadn't gone to seminary. He hadn't been theologically trained. He just knew what the Bible said. He knew he loved the Lord, and he knew he had to go. And so he went. And Carrie's first 10 years on the mission field in India, this simple man became fluent in 12 languages. So great was his passion for missions. 
He taught. He translated the Bible. In fact, his translation of the Bible into Sanskrit is still used today. William Carey. He followed the prophet Isaiah's response to God's call. God said, who shall I send? And in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. Let me be the one to go. I'll go for you, Lord. And that's what William Carey did. Others were inspired and quickly followed Carey's lead. Hudson Taylor caught a boat and went to China and founded the China Inland Mission, touching countless tens of thousands of people in the name of Christ. Carey wrote a book entitled, An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. <laughs> kind of a long title for a book. And in this book, he proposed the formation of voluntary societies because the church wasn't doing it, gang. The church was drying up. The church was dead, especially as far as evangelism was concerned. It was not happening. And so he writes this book proposing the formation of voluntary societies of Christian ministers and laymen whose skills could be put to the use of world missions. But it wasn't Carrie who stirred things up. Too much was happening simultaneously from churches in England to Scotland to Germany to America. Across the page, the Holy Spirit was calling and people began to answer. I was telling Cheryl as I, we drove back up, we went down to pick up Hayden and we were talking in the car for a few minutes before I got here tonight. And I was saying it is so stunning, it's so amazing to look at these epochs of church history and to watch how the Holy Spirit begins to pull things together and to motivate and to move people. And with Philadelphia, a lot of things began happening in the late 1700s and on into the 1800s. And even in the church to a, to a degree today, Philadelphia is still alive and well. There still are missions-oriented churches. And it's not just about world missions. It's not just being sent away. It's people with a passion for the lost. And you see, growing, vibrant churches are churches where the people are outwardly focused and not inwardly focused. For the moment a church begins to look inward, it begins the process of death. Well, missionary societies and Bible societies began to spring up, and a passion was born for global evangelism. Men, let me give you some names here. Adoniram Judson went to India. Robert Bruce went to Persia. In fact, this man, Persia, which is Iran today, had an incredibly hard time and wrote about the constant struggle of just trying to get one person to believe, but he went. He went and he preached the word. William Wilberforce, known for his campaigns against the slave trade. The famous David Livingston in Africa. You may have heard tales of Livingston. Samuel, Samuel Crowther. Samuel Crowther is an interesting one. Born in Nigeria under the name Ajai, captured as a slave at 15, his slave ship was intercepted by a British warship, and he was taken to Sierra Leone. There he accepted Christ. There his life was transformed, and in 1857, he went on to lead the Niger Mission, and he became the first black Anglican bishop. God was moving in all these different lives. The stories, they go on and on during this era. Along with revival, by the way, in America, under the preaching of men like C.H. Spurgeon and D.L. Moody, God's Spirit was activating suddenly, surprisingly, at a time when the church was dead. At a time, gang, when the denominations, when Protestantism and Catholicism were at loggerheads, were so concerned with, with fighting. Sardis, <laughs> Sardis had become more like, I guess you could call them sardines, <laughs> because they were dead fish, packing little tin cans more concerned with their own selves, with, with defending what they were trying to be, than going out and bringing offensively, positively, the gospel to the lost. Why is it that the Spirit so obviously began moving at this time? A couple of reasons I'll share with you. Number one, it had been 1,000 years. This is almost unbelievable, but it's true. It had been 1,000 years since anyone had launched out into a foreign missions effort. For a thousand years, gang, the church sat stagnant. The church was concerned only for itself. While the lost in places like China and India and East Asia were, were dying, without the hope of Jesus Christ, the church was inwardly focused, and so much so that for a thousand years the word did not go out like it began to go out at the end of the 1700s with a passion. Which goes back to what I shared this morning. If you're not evangelizing, you're fossilizing. And that's the deal. If I'm not telling someone about Jesus, I'm closing up shop. And so the Lord says, you want to be a vibrant, active Christian? You want to have a faith that's alive? Here's how you do it. Tell someone about me. 
Like we said last, name, last week, drop my name. Share the name of Jesus. If you want to be ignited in your faith, talk about the Lord and you can't help but be ignited. His spirit will move in your life. Well, I have no training. I have no ability. You think, you think that uh, William Carey had ability? He was a cobbler. Great, he could go over to India and fix shoes. And yet within such a short amount of time to learn the languages, translating the Bible, the Holy Spirit took over this man's life and worked. And that's what happens. We talked about this morning. You're disqualified for ministry. Every one of us are disqualified. Every one of us feel disqualified. I don't have anything really to bring for the Lord. You know what? Open your mouth and speak the name of Jesus to someone who doesn't know him. And you will bring more than you can ever imagine for the kingdom. For the kingdom. Kerry put it this way. He said, attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Do something that's so big... That without God, it's doomed to fail. That's a life that's fun to live. Step out and take a risk that is absolutely ridiculous, but in the hands of God can be done. And trust Him with the result. Trust Him to do what He said He would do. Now, there's something else interesting to note about the Spirit's timing at this time of church history. Not only had it been a thousand years since the church had not been involved in missions campaigns and getting the Bible out... It had also been almost 1,400 years since the church had taught and believed in the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. In the idea of the church being raptured. You see, early on in the church, that was taught. That was believed. You see it in the writings of Paul, clearly. You pick it up in the writings of Peter. You especially see in the writings of John in the book of Revelation this idea that Jesus is going to come, that he will return, that he would set up his kingdom, the kingdom that he promised to Israel and all those pages in the Old Testament. He's going to come and do that. This was absolutely sure. And for the first roughly 300 years of the church's existence, this is what was taught. But then some things changed. Late 300s, the Alexandrian school of thought, Men like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, St. Augustine. St. Augustine wrote his very famous book, The City of God. Augustine did some phenomenal things for the church. Augustine was possibly the most influential person at that stage in church history. But let me tell you something else. Augustine also propagated the idea that the Old Testament scriptures had to be allegorical. They were metaphorical. They were useful to us spiritually, and so these men began to spiritualize the Bible. Well, why not? I mean, it's 300, 312, suddenly the church is no longer being persecuted. Suddenly the church and the state, as we learned in the study of Pergamum, which means objectionable marriage, the church and the state were one. Everything was cool. Everything was great for the church. The kingdom is here. Now we can start just living out our lives on this earth for the kingdom. And so this whole idea of a millennial reign of Christ began to fade, began to not be taught, began to be replaced by allegory and metaphor that prophecy, Bible prophecy, just couldn't be taken literally. Well, we'll come back to that. But mark these days again, 1793, to the rapture of the church. This is the time of Philadelphia in the church age. How about we read this letter? You want to? Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, write, the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now remember, there is no punitive or corrective accusation for Philadelphia. He has nothing negative to say about the church at Philadelphia. Why? Because Jesus would say in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. John chapter 4 verse 34 My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And then he explains what that work is. He says, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white for the harvest. And he was talking about human souls. In fact, right after Jesus said that, all the people from this little town in Samaria where he was standing with his disciples began coming over the hill to hear about this Jesus Christ, about this man who told this woman at the well that he was the Messiah. The will of him who sent me is to save that which was lost. 
Which is why, again, when a person finally and completely gives in to Christ Jesus, life ceases to be about them. If we could only get a hold of that, then my life is not about me. It's not about my worries, my threats, my cares, my doubts, my concerns. That is all a waste of my time. My life is about the salvation of other people's lives. Man, once I'm in Christ, if I can understand that, as we said this morning, it changes Everything. Well, Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a city that was started in the Mideast, in Asia Minor, Turkey today. It was started in the year 189 B.C. Philadelphia was founded by a man whose name was Eumenes II. Eumenes II had left Thyatira to start this new city, which was very successful in its growth. But when he died, he was succeeded by his brother, another very successful businessman, city planter, his brother's name was Atalus II. You have Eumenes II and his brother Atalus II. And these two brothers were tight. These two brothers were very close. And after Eumenes' death, Atalus began to build great buildings and name them after his brother Eumenes. He minted coins that on one side had Atalus' face, his face as the, as the founder, as the leader of this town, and his brother's face on the other side as the founder of this city. He lived to honor the memory of his brother. People in that region began to take note of Atalus' great love for his brother, and so they began calling the city Philios Delphia, the city of brotherly love. Philio, the, the Greek word for brotherly love. There are four different words in the Greek for love. Phileo is brotherly love, the love, the passion for a brother. Now remember, remember as we study Revelation, there are no coincidences as far as God's word is concerned. No coincidences. He didn't pick seven churches out of a hat and just say, oh, let's send seven churches and they'll just generically represent. No, he had seven churches in mind. Seven churches in Asia Minor that needed to hear these messages, but also seven churches that God knew would represent these different stages of the church throughout church history. So the letter to Philadelphia, this mission-minded evangelical church of real brotherly love, this church that really was concerned about those outside its walls, this is no exception to the rule. Philadelphia, the church, the city of brotherly love. Well, he goes on and he says, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this. Now, before we see what he says, this is the partial revelation. Remember, each letter, each letter begins with a partial revelation of Jesus Christ. And so this is a partial revelation. Jesus is drawing John back to the revelation he had seen. And he says, I'm the one who's holy, who's true. I have the key of David. Now, wait a minute. You might say, hang on. Did, did he say that before? Well, let's look. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. One page back, he says, I am the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus changes his designation here. Now, with everything else, he sticks pretty close to how he was revealed to John before. With every other letter, they get to Philadelphia, and suddenly it's not the keys to death in Hades. It's the key of David. I'm the one who has the key of David. Now, what's going on here? Why the shift, Jesus? What are you trying to say? Well, a couple things to know. First off, understand that these are not keys of incarceration. These are keys of liberation, not keys for locking people up. But Jesus holds keys, holds keys for letting people out. But why does he redesignate these keys? No longer are they the keys of death in Hades. They're now the keys of David. Where does this come from? Flip in your Bibles. Keep your finger there in Revelation and go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah is easy to find. Right in the middle. Okay, 22. Isaiah, by the way, is a book of prophecy itself referred to quite a bit in the book of Revelation. You'll see as we go through, and you may already be seeing this, how often we end up out back in the book of Isaiah. But Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 15, an interesting prophecy about something going on in the day. Let me just read this to you. Isaiah 22 verse 15. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come and go to this steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? And whom do you have here? That you have hewn a tomb for yourself here. You who hew a tomb on the height. 
You who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man. He's about to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball. Don't you love the imagery of Scripture? To be cast into a vast country, there you will die, and there your splendid chariots will be. You shame of your master's house. I will depose you from your office. I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority. And he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Listen to this. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. Here's the key. Here's the key. It's the key to understanding this passage as well. The key to the house of David I will set on his shoulder. And look what he says. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. Exactly what Jesus said. Okay, so we know we're in the right place. Jesus says, I'm the one who has the keys of David. The one who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one will open. What in the world is all this talking about? Who's Shebna and Eliakim? What do these guys have to do with anything? Shebna was the treasurer of the house of Judah when Hezekiah was king. That was his job. He oversaw the temple treasury. And as the treasurer, he wore, and this was traditional in the day, he wore on a huge ring on his shoulder, around his shoulder, he wore the keys to the treasury. So when you see the keys being worn on the shoulder, that's what it's talking about. When he says, I'm going to set the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. I'm taking it from you, Shebna, and I'm giving it to this other man, Eliakim, who I'm going to raise up to take care of the treasury. Well, why is that? Shebna had been using the key to let himself into the temple treasury and pilfer a bit of the money. Not a wise move where the Lord is concerned. He used the money, this is interesting, to buy graves for himself. That was the first thing he did, was he had nice graves hewn out of the rock. Which is kind of funny, because whenever we use the riches and resources God has given us for his glory, we're just investing in our own graves if we don't use it for the Lord. And that's what he was doing. He was investing in his own death. He also bought chariots, and he would ride around the kingdom dressing high and flashy and with his stolen riches. And so Isaiah, the prophet, came with condemnation to this man, Shebna, and he said, You're out of here, buddy. The key is now torn from your shoulder, Shebna, and it's given to another man whose name is Eliakim. Eliakim. Just found out something this afternoon about Eliakim. I'll share with you in a moment. It's amazing. But this story also prophetically speaks of another keeper of the keys. One on whom shoulder rests the keys to the kingdom of David. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Stay in Isaiah 22. I'll just read this other passage to you. Isaiah 9 6 tells us, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. The keeper of the keys, Jesus Christ, who would have the key to David. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. But go back to Isaiah chapter 22. Listen to what he says now about Eliakim. Eliakim, who now, a man of integrity, a godly man. And Isaiah prophesies, we're going to take the keys of the kingdom, the keys of, of David, off the shoulder of Shebna, and give them to Eliakim. And he says in verse 23, I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. So they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of the vessels from bulls to all the jars, in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. And it will even break off and fall. And the load hanging on it will be cut off. For the Lord has spoken. What in the world is this? What's he talking about? I mean, I understand, you know, you're using some symbolism here, Isaiah. And you say that he's going to drive him like a peg in a firm place. Okay, this is a solid man that you can trust. You can give him the key. He's got integrity. This guy's okay. But this speaks... This speaks powerfully of Jesus, of the keeper of the keys of the kingdom of David. Eliakim is a picture of Jesus Christ for what happened to Jesus, but he was set. He was driven by pegs into a firm place. 
The word peg there is also translated nails. I will drive him like a nail. Jesus was driven by nails into the cross, into a firm place. Well, what happened after that? Verse 25, in that day the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It will even break off and fall. The load hanging on it, our sin, your sin, my sin, the load hanging on it will fall away. It will be cut off. For the Lord has spoken. Here's what I found out about Eliakim this afternoon. Not only was Eliakim described as being held in place by nails, just like Jesus, but Eliakim's name, his name means God who rises. God who rises. Jesus was driven by pegs, by nails, into a firm place, the cross. And Jesus is the God who rises, the God who rose from the dead. And he holds the keys of David, the keys that open and no one can shut. And they shut and no one can open. And it's not surprising. It's not surprising that in these last days, Jesus is opening doors right and left. It is not surprising as you look across the history of the church that you land at this one place toward the end of the seven churches, toward the end of days, and suddenly Jesus is opening doors right and left. I shared this morning that our missionaries, Brian and Ruth, over in Pokhara, Nepal, and this is exactly what Brian wrote in the email. He said, God has opened a door. He's opened a door for us. And I'm reading this and I'm going, it's incredible. Brian's talking about an open door. I'm studying about the open door. Philadelphia could also be known as the church of the open door because that's the church that when Jesus opens the door, they walk through. They go through. Jesus, Jesus opens the door of salvation. He, he gives opportunity. He gives us the words to share. And then when it's all said and done, you know what he says to us? Good job. Well done. Way to go. I didn't do anything. You opened the door, Lord. You gave me the word. It's like when, when Hayden was younger and I'd take him driving. Stick him on my lap. We'd go out driving the car and I'd pull into the driveway. And of course he wasn't driving. He was just, his feet couldn't even get down to the pedals. He'd just hold on to the steering wheel and feel like he was driving. Please don't tell the police. But we had a good time doing this. <laughs> and we'd pull into the driveway and I would say to Hayden, good job, son. Now had I let him really drive, we would have been in serious trouble. He didn't do anything. I provided the power, the impetus, the opportunity, everything. He just went for the ride. And that's what Jesus wants to do with you. He opens the doors. He'll give you the words. You go along for the ride. All you've got to be willing to do is sit in his lap in the front seat and go for the drive. And he will take you where you need to be. So he opens doors. But what does he shut? Because he also says, I'm, I'm the one who shuts doors. You can go back to Revelation chapter 3. I open the doors and no one will shut. I shut and no one opens. When did God do that? This is a little more sobering. At the first tribulation, that is the first act of worldwide judgment, all the way back in Genesis chapter 6, we read of a man named Noah. The first time God destroyed the earth. Some of you know where I'm going. God shut a door. He shut a door. Genesis chapter 7 verse 16 says those that entered, male and female of all flesh, speaking of going into the ark, they entered as God had commanded Noah and the Lord closed behind him. The Lord shut the door. He opened the door for Noah and his family to provide eternal salvation for all of mankind. He opened the door. But once they were safe and sound, tucked away in that ark, God literally closed in behind them. The Bible doesn't even say he closed the door. It says he closed in and shut them in safely. But the tragedy is the rest of humanity was shut out and was not saved. That was the first time the world was destroyed. And it will happen again. The door closes, gang, on those who want the door closed. For 40, what was it, 40 years that Noah built the ark? And over that entire time, Noah was preaching. He was telling people about it. What are you building that stupid boat for, Noah? Well, God says he's going to destroy the earth. Oh, yeah, whatever, nice try. Have fun with your boat, you know. Not a cloud in the sky. People did not want to be saved. We say, well, how could God be so cruel as to destroy everybody on planet earth except for eight people? Everybody didn't want to be saved. The world had rebelled and rejected God. They did not want salvation. I mentioned this just after we finished last week. There is a time when a man is unable to say yes to the Lord. 
there is a point that a person can reach where, re where turning to the Lord while receiving salvation won't happen. Why? Because they have gone so far that they do not want it. You're going to see this as we go through this book in stunning instances where God is pulling out the stops to bring salvation to people and people are saying, whatever. I don't want what you have. I will not bow to you. I will not be your servant. Again, that time when someone refuses to say yes to the Lord is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus means when he says in Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I say to you, any sin, any blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. Why, does God just have a point where he just isn't tolerant anymore? No, listen to this. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven because you are saying that the very one who can save you is not the one who can save you. You're saying the salvation that the Holy Spirit alone can bring, he's not capable of. You're saying you don't want it. Blasphemy, it's the word blasphemeo in the Greek and it means abusive speech, depreciation, or a word of evil. And gain blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is vilifying the only one who can actually save. And it takes a heart that is an abject and total rebellion to God to get to that point. Now, you may have in your life been at times where you severely doubted God, where you felt like you were just angry with God. That's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't be here tonight. Listen to me. You wouldn't be here tonight if you had committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because if you had, your heart would have gone so far in rebellion, you'd never want to have anything to do with Him. That's why it's unforgivable. Because the person will not turn to receive forgiveness.